big warm welcome. Um, it's almost like the Big Brother House or something, isn't it? It's welcome to day five of the Big Brother House. It's our fifth Listen, Imagine, Compose um, teacher CPG session um, taking place this summer. Um, this, the theme of this week is creativity and com composing. Um, com creativity is sort of a big subject, so we thought we'd, we'd um, have a whole session dedicated to it and have some reflections on around what that might mean you know to us as practitioners but also to um the way that we teach in the classroom as well um so uh as well as myself i'm judith robinson i'm head of education at sound and music um i'm joined by the listener magic compose partners who are nancy evans from birmingham contemporary music group and uh, martin faultley from birmingham city university um we're also joined by a couple of other uh, people who are based at Birmingham City University, um, Victoria Kinsella and Kirsty Devaney both work on the staff there and are taking some of the sessions today. Uh, we're also joined by um, Louise Hayward, who is a teacher in Solihull, I think, certainly West Midlands. And um, we're going to be, jo we are joined as well by Marie Besant, who is the subject lead at OCR. Um, she's going to contribute to the conversation as well. Um, so uh, that's what we're doing today. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping things. It'd be great if you could keep yourselves muted if you're not actually speaking. It just helps with all the background noise. Um, I recommend that you put your Zoom account into speaker view because that way you get to see the screen that's being shared more clearly. Um, maybe when you go into the breakout groups, you might like to go back into the sort of tile view so that you can see people as you're talking to them and discussing. Um, and if you're having bandwidth problems, we suggest switching off the video. Um, might help the audio, audio quality a bit. Um, and we are recording this session, so we'll edit it afterwards and um, put it on the Listen Imagine Compose website so that if there's things you want to revisit, you can do so. I think we've got videos one to three there so far. So uh, we're keeping it fairly well. Um, Great, I think that's everything I wanted to say. I'm gonna hand over to Martin, who is going to kick off for us with um, a little bit of context. Over to you, Martin. Thank you, hopefully you can see a PowerPoint. Um, so I want to talk, um, I want to talk about the, the, the topic today, which is creativity. Um, Victoria will be talking in a, in, a, in a little bit, and so she is going to dig deep into some of these discussions, definitions, and thinking. So I just thought I'd, I'd share a fairly recent one, which comes from the Durham Commission. And the idea of creativity is the capacity to imagine, conceive, express, or make something that was not there before. And in composing terms, I think that's quite important for us because it doesn't say stunningly original, unique, a work of genius, you have to lock yourself up in a garret in Paris for six months in order to produce it. But it's just something that wasn't there before. This is the, the notion of creativity. Um, I, maybe it's because I'm, I'm now so old, but creative music used to have overtones of the 1970s in a very sort of pejorative way. And people would, would talk about, oh, that's that creative music nonsense sort of stuff. Um, I, I wonder if we've now sort of grown out of that um, usage so that we do we still use the term pejoratively? So I wonder. But I do think sometimes that creativity as a term is, is, is quite possibly overused. We, we hear it a lot and we talk about it and, and some people talk about it inappropriately. And so the point for today is that composing is a creative act, but in the creativity literature, it talks about ex nihilo, out of nothing creation. So it's not that um, you're wandering along uh, harmlessly in your lockout bubble and suddenly a piece of music crumbs to you in your head fully formed with, with no work at all. That's not the sort of creativity we're thinking about. Bowdoin, one of the key authors, said this, it's not a single capacity, nor is it a special one. It, it's just a general aspect of intelligence. And I think for us, that's really important. We're not talking about um, some special program for special people with especially wealthy parents. We're talking about something which goes for everybody. Victoria is going to dig into these a, a lot more um, in, in the bit that she's talking about soon. But two of the key phrases are little c creativity from Anna Craft and p creativity from Margaret Bowden. 
And I think it's important to say, even though music teachers may have heard something similar many, many times over, it's new for the pupils that are making it. And it's that little C creativity, the pre-creative task, which they do, they do for the first time, and the music teacher thinks, oh my word, I've heard somebody roll the beta up and down the xylophone 17,000 times already this month. But for the kid, that's the first time they've done it. That's a new utterance for them. And it's taking that seriously, taking their compositions, their early creative utterances seriously, and being worthy of consideration. Um, John Sloboda, ages ago, wrote about composition skill, the existence of a repertoire of ways of extending and building. And maybe that's one of the things that we do in education, is that we try and involve people extending and building on ideas. And one of the nuggets that we had in the original Listen, Imagine, Compose all those years ago, was we talked about the green shoots and the kids come up with green shoots, but they sort of expect it somehow to become a fully fledged composition straight away without too much work. That's not how it works. Extending and building is really important. Susan Young's done an awful lot of work on early years music. And this is, um, I will read it because I appreciate that reading on the screen is a problem. Kyle, two years, four months, plays on his own with a small wooden train set on the floor and is concentrating on setting the train onto its tracks and pushing it smoothly along. As he does this, he melodizes a long, free-flowing strand of wordless melody on open vowel sounds of do and ah. The rhythm is very free and the pitch moves across a wide range. And a lot of our early years colleagues have written about the early creative outputs of children. Is this a composition that Carl is doing, aged two years and four months? And these are questions that it's worthy of us thinking about, especially in a climate where I have read a number of times recently, nobody can be creative until they know everything there is to know about the subject. Well, I wonder if little Kyle is being creative. What does he know about his long, free-flowing melody? I don't know. And so I've, I've posed this question before a couple of times in, in the CPD sessions, but I am wondering how, not how much, but how little children and young people in our schools and elsewhere need to know and be able to do before they can start composing. And if we think about little Kyle, I think that's an important place to, to take it from. I am troubled when I see things like this. This came from 2016, 2017 research. Um, this is from the Pew Research um, Organization, who asked, I don't know if you can see the cursor if I point to things, it's more important that schools in our country teach students basic academic skills and encourage discipline or to be creative and think independently and spot where people in the UK think to be creative and independently is and it's below what they call then emerging and developing countries. So actually UK comes out bottom if you ask the population whether it's important to be creative and to think independently um, and we come out nearly at the top, Kenya slightly beats us on the idea of basic academic skills and encouraging discipline. So I, I have worries about what's happening out there in the world. Um, and I won't share my worries about announcements in today and recent weeks too much, apart from the fact that there are things that concern me. So I've got some questions, um, which are these. So what is creativity in music education? What is creativity when composing? Is music education automatically creative? I hear from some SLTs that say, well, yes, music's on the subject. That's an automatically creative subject. Uh, creative subject is it's on the curriculum it's creative is creativity in the important in the curriculum see news this week need i say more if not depress yourselves by looking at it are there people who might think creativity is not a good thing and if you hang around on education twitter long enough you'll meet some of these are composing listening and performing all equally creative are some creativities better by which i mean valued more highly by society than others um, Marie is lurking there in one of the little screens that I can see. So do examinations value creativity um, that we can, we can be talking about later? And does key stage three value creativity? So those are the questions I'm going to pose. As usual, this will be available later. There's a list of references. 
um, and that was my five minutes, uh, I was going to say in the sunshine, but today it's five minutes dodging raindrops. Thank you, Martin. Yeah, so we'll come back to those questions when we have our breakout groups later and perhaps um, give some more thought to that. But to put some more sort of um, context to the idea of creativity and to think about our own creativity in particular, um, I'm going to hand over to Victoria Kinsella. Um, thank you, Victoria. Well, it's really great to be here today. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about creativity, but before we delve into the session, I want us to do two exercises so you will need to get your pen and paper ready and the first thing that I'd like you to do is on your piece of paper I would like you to draw something in your room very quickly and when I say go you have 45 seconds ready steady go okay stop that's it fantastic perhaps you can just hold it up to your screen so we can just perhaps see Oh, lots of coffee cups. Yeah, I'm just guessing lots of coffee there. Absolutely. Okay. Second, if you could just perhaps turn your piece of paper over. Um, the second task that we're going to do was developed by J.P. Guilford in 1967, and it's called the Alternative Uses Test. And it aims to stretch your creativity by giving you two minutes to think of as many uses as possible for an everyday object like a chair, a coffee mug, or a brick. Now I'm only going to give you one minute because we don't have that much time today, but I would like you to brainstorm uses for a paperclip. You've got one minute. Okay, stop. Again, if you've got anything written down, you can hold it up to the screen. Okay, some interesting things. Something to do with something for an iPhone, holding pieces of paper together, earrings. Okay, that's really great. That's really good. Fantastic. Thank you all for partaking in that. But I wonder how that made you feel. So as adults, sometimes we often lose the freedom that we once had as children and we can be taught out of our playfulness and our ability to think creatively. But I think as Martin said earlier, creativity can often be misunderstood. It is not just for special people who have original ideas. It is for everybody and it can be recognised in every subject. It just needs to be given value. In the last 30 years, there has been a re-emergence and re-emphasis on creativity in education policy. And there's an increase in economic demand for creative knowledge. It is no longer enough for learners simply to pass examinations. They have to draw from a wide range of experiences and be able to apply them in new and creative ways. So for creative knowledge to be developed, it needs to be encouraged with the opportunity for creative practice. And obviously this is where you come in. Creative learners need creative teachers who will encourage them to take creative risks. Now, I'm sure you all know the value of creativity, especially in music, and its importance for education in the 21st century. However, I also recognize that many of you face extreme pressures at the moment, including performance assessment outputs, value-added scores and pay-related structures, and you often have time pressures and a limited amount of time for what you think might be creativity. But even the most creative of us sometimes struggle to know how to develop it and see it in action when we have all these deadlines and examinations and marking on our mind. But I don't think creativity has to be something that you see as being other. Actually, creativity is at the heart of everything that you do on a daily basis. Now, Martin mentioned earlier the Durham Commission, and the Durham Commission on Creativity in Education was published last year, and it identifies creativity as a critical element of any education system that seeks to future-proof prosperity and maximise its opportunity for all children and young people. And the report set out 10 recommendations. So they said that they wanted to have, or they suggested a national network of creativity collaboratives, to consider the role of examinations and how scholarship and craftsmanship are recognised and rewarded in assessment frameworks. That Ofsted inspections should um, identify creativity within their inspection reports. It also suggested that um, England should participate in PISA 2021 evaluation of creative thinking tests. To 
um, develop research-informed practice and that's where schools for example and university institutions should work together to try and develop research-informed practice. It also said that the education system should support young people to engage creatively and critical with digital technology, that arts and culture should be an essential part of the education for every child, no matter disabilities or special educational needs, um, it should be for everybody, that it should be recognised and encouraged in the early years. And I think the notion of that idea of recognised maybe has something to do with assessment within the early years. That in school opportunities should be complemented by diverse routes to take part in creative activities outside of school, which is interesting in terms of is it should it be fully in school, out of school, should we have a combination of both? And if it is for all children, then what kind of funding structures are offered to ensure that both it is in school and out of school? And finally, that young people should be better prepared changing world of work and that's where creativity they're saying is a key part of provision at key stage three as a significant problem, huge impact on that but i think what was really good about the durham commission and the recognition that the most disadvantaged are actually the least likely to benefit from access to a creative education as creativity and creative engagement but they do say that you know creativity is essential for well-being as well social and economic prosperity and the personal development of all young people now in the Durham Commission as you have seen they did say that um, England should participate in PISA 2021 and the creative thinking test and this would be the first time that PISA would have tested creative thinking. One of the key issues facing educators from around the world is understanding the policy to practice issues underpinning creativity. And there is a growing consensus that formal education should cultivate the creativity and the creative thinking skills of students to help them succeed. But teachers and countries' ability to foster and monitor progress is limited by often a lack of a clear understanding between all countries of how some of these skills materialise at different development stages. And one reason why these competences are not promoted in a systematic way is that education systems have rarely established a way to assess them formally. And that's where PISA have come in and that's why they have designed a creative thinking test. However, England has decided to opt out of the creative thinking test. Ultimately, what does that signify in terms of our government's thinking about creativity and its importance within the curriculum? Now, there is still a lack of understanding of the synergy between creativity and its importance for all subjects. But kind of going back to what Martin was saying at the beginning, I think that all the arts, music, art, design, dance, drama, literature, and so forth, are all synonymous with creativity. The arts offer a specific way of knowing about and being in the world. So what does the government choice of not taking up the creativity test signify? What does this mean for creativity? How can we promote creativity during this political agenda? And obviously with all the discussions that are going on at the moment, what will happen kind of post COVID-19 in terms of what will the curriculum look like in school? and where will creativity be. But having thought about this, that every child should have the right to participate fully in cultural and an artistic life, and therefore our jobs are ever more important for promoting creativity and music. But how can we develop creativity in our pupils? And what does creativity even look like in music and how can it be recognised? I want us to start thinking about our own creativity. And on your piece of paper somewhere, are sticks of creativity that you think are important? I'm gonna give you 45 seconds. So very, very quick. Okay, I'm gonna leave you that to ponder. 
The NACI report states that teachers cannot develop the creative abilities of their learners if their own creative abilities are suppressed. Part of developing creativity in the classroom is opening up the classroom space to become one of dialogue and diversity. Discussions around creativity have enabled researchers to distinguish between creative teaching, teaching for creativity and creative learning. And this is all very well and good that the literature has recognised this, but how is this fostered in your classrooms? Well, according to the NACI report in 1999, creative teaching involves teachers using imaginative approaches to make learning more interesting, exciting and effective. But not only do we need to consider approaches that make learning fun, but also the pedagogical process involved. And teaching for creativity is a way that teachers can encourage and help develop the learners' own creative thinking and behaviours. A key part of this process involves making learning relevant to the learners' own interests and lives, making connections to their prior experiences and valuing their contributions to new knowledge. All too often we can take an instructional and quite passive approach to teaching where we prescribe knowledge and I'm not saying that there is no place for classroom um, delivery of knowledge of specific knowledge, of course there is, but if we are going to start to develop forward thinkers, creative and active learners, we need to go beyond these pedagogies and develop that even further. We need to help facilitate learners to deal with sometimes unpleasant uncomfortable or difficult concepts and we need to push them out of their comfort zones and sometimes throw them a curveball. So let's take stock. If young people's creative abilities are likely to be developed in an atmosphere in which your creative abilities and interests are properly engaged too, then it's important to consider our own musical identity. So what is your favourite mode of musical creativity? And where do you feel most comfortable exampling that musical creativity? So I want you to just think about that. You don't have to write it down, but that's something to think about, especially when you then think about the pupils within your classroom. What music do they listen to? Have they experienced music at events? Do your interests align with your pupils? Or is there value in your differing or similar interests? So I'd like you to think about that as we continue on and think about uh, creativity. Now I've interviewed many teachers over the years on their strategies for creative teaching and teaching for creativity. And here are the most common things that I have heard from teachers. So for creative teaching, they say that understanding the space, that space and time has to be given for thought, but also free from immediate criticism before ideas are subject to further development. So that goes back to the literature about young people being able to incubate their ideas, think about them, work on them, and then move forward. Often, as we all know, we're under quite a lot of time pressure. So how do you offer those kind of spaces for thinking and space and time? Having a clear sense of pupil needs and the ability to read a classroom situation. So really thinking about young people's uh, needs in terms of special educational needs, perhaps they're gifted and talented and therefore they may need to be fully, fully stretched, but giving a clear sense of the pupils' needs and developing something that is about them individually. To take risks, but also be able to monitor and evaluate activities, encourage learners in periods of free play, which you can often see within the early years, but I actually think needs to be adopted all the way through testing out ideas, for example, and time given for that. Emphasising the use of imaginary, imagination, originality, curiosity, and questioning. You know, the importance of questioning in creative classroom is really important. Teaching for creativity, that there should be autonomy for both the teacher and learner, a feeling of ownership for both teachers and learners, and control over the ideas that they're producing authenticity in their responses. So again, that goes back to giving a sense of ownership and that there is some sort of authenticity in what they're producing. Openness to new and unusual ideas. I'm sure we've all had instances within our classrooms where young people have come to us with very interesting ideas, but it's about going with those ideas and trying to help them develop it even further. Respect for each other and for the ideas that emerge. 
and a feeling of anticipation, satisfaction, and enjoyment of a creative relationship within the classroom. So what is creative learning? Well, Wood suggests that during creative learning, pupils have control over their own learning process and ownership of the knowledge produced, which is relevant to their concerns. This relevance leads to what we would call intrinsic motivation, excitement, enthusiasm, and ownership of knowledge. And that intrinsic motivation is really important that they're doing it for themselves as much as anything else, such as an exam. So creative learning is about the potential to motivate and engage learners where they become independent thinkers. And now back in 2008, the QCA outlined five behavioral elements of creative learning, which although that seems quite a long time ago now, I still think are really relevant today. And they say that creative learning is about asking questions, making connections, imagining what might be, exploring options, and enabling young people to reflect critically. And my question to you and something for you to ponder is what do these components look like in your music and teaching uh, learning and your classrooms? But what about the recognition of creativity? Now Martin mentioned Margaret Burden earlier and her book, The Creative Mind, Myths and Mechanisms is something that I highly suggest you look at if you're interested in creativity. And in that she tries to dispel many of the romantic myths about it. Now, she also tries to make the creative process more transparent and show how it can be taught, learnt and valued. She looked at creativity from an everyday perspective and drew a distinction between two forms of a creative idea, which Martin mentioned earlier. Firstly, she questioned the ability to produce novelties with the respect of the mind of an individual. And she calls this psychological creativity, P-creativity. So Bowden states that if Mary Smith combines an idea in a way she's never done before, or if she has an idea which she could not have had before, her idea is P-creative, no matter how many people have had that same idea already. This idea becomes more profound within society when it moves into a historical realm. Mary Smith's surprising idea is H-creative, only if no one has had the idea before her. So this notion of P-creativity and H-creativity opens up the realms of creativity within the everyday site of learning. And in education, the concept of P-creativity holds as much precedence as that of H-creativity. Indeed, for classroom purposes, the notion of P-creativity allows us to recognise creative actions of a pupil which we as adults may have seen many times before. And this distinction is very important as it values the centrality of the learner experience. We then led on to an important question, can creativity be assessed? And I'm sure you've all read work, you know, Martin's work about music and assessment, and I'm not going to go into any theory on musical assessment here, but, and it's interesting that Marie's here and we're talking later, I really like this quote from Amarbele, and she says, we may no longer desire to do something we once enjoyed, after we've been forced to do it for the sake of meeting a deadline or exam. What does this mean for creativity? That's open for discussion later. It'll be really interesting in Marie's discussion later on to think about that. But thinking about music in particular, Bernard challenged historical notions of creativity as being linked to singular activities and this notion of a creative genius. Instead, she suggests a pluralist conception of creativities, where we move um, to an understanding of music and creativity in line with real world practices. Now, she investigated the practices of 19 diverse musicians, and she argued that musical creativity is based on archaic traditional beliefs and myths about classical composers. And thus, music has promoted a Western classical narrative of practice which marginalizes other forms of musical creativity. She suggests that this creates hierarchies and misconceptions about the musical creative process. There often can be elite views of musical creativity, such as the lone composer, and the modern industry of music requires us to think beyond this and expand our vision of what creativity is to include such things as the DJ and producer, as well as jamming sessions, 
so that it has cultural relevance within the classroom and ultimately be more inclusive. So she's consistently advocated for the notion of musical creativity, thinking about this pluralist notion, rather than a singular conception. We're not going to do it now, but again, this is another thinking point for you. Can you list the range of musical creativities present within your classrooms? What are present within your ensembles or orchestras? What about the different cultures, experiences, communication needs, or inclusion in genders are needed to think about this notion of musical creativities? So bearing this in mind and thinking about diversity, how do you set up an environment that encourages creativity? Now, I like this quote also by Bernard, where she says, while well, some children prefer to work alone, others prefer to engage collaboratively, communally, collectively, technologically networked, whereupon being a group member responsible for jointly authoring a piece can be replayed across time, space and purpose. Persons. But what does a creative music classroom look like? What type of environment is afforded in your schools or educational environments? Perhaps a young person does like to work alone and that is creative within itself, but how do you encourage them to take risks and often work in groups or produce a creative composition in groups with others? And how do you recognise that creativity individually? Now, just to kind of finish up, and that has been a kind of whirlwind introduction into creativity, so I, I do apologise for a lot that I've been throwing at you in terms of all the different technological kind of terms. But I really think that this kind of quote from Carl Rogers is really important when we think about how we want to develop creativity within our classrooms. And I always remind myself of this. He states, in education, we tend to turn out conformists, stereotypes, individuals who educations, whose education is completed rather than freely creative and original thinkers. You're here today because that's not you, but new visions and outlooks of our lessons are informed by our day-to-day -day experiences. And they also require us to reflect on those experiences. And this enables us to call into question our practices. I think this is really important to kind of leave you on this kind of thinking and post. An effective and creative teacher is always changing what they do. And this is because they are continually learning and fostering creativity or creativities themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. That was, um, yeah, that was a, a, a very whistle-stop tour of a, an enormous subject but it's really nice to have it linked so closely back to music and, and to composing teaching composing especially it's really useful thank you um, I'm going to pass straight to Kirsty Bainey who is a composer who is also working at Birmingham City University at the moment and Kirsty's going to reflect it's, a, it's sort of drawing on the original listener magic compose sort of model of working where we paired up um, researchers with composers with classroom teachers and their pupils um, so to sort of follow that model, uh, Kirsty's going to talk to us from the point of view as, as a composer and the sort of creativity that she employs. Thanks, Kirsty. Well, uh, I'm going to keep it on so I can see everybody. So I don't just see myself talking to myself, which is always really off putting. Also, I've made some notes which are just to the right of my screen. So if I'm looking that way, <laughs> that's why just to try and keep me on track with time and to stop me trying to go off on a tangent which if anybody sees me present sometimes I do I get a bit too carried away um, but that's not necessarily a bad thing right so thank you so much for inviting me Judith to come to this session I've been really enjoying watching the the videos online catching up as the sessions have been really annoyingly clashing with other things I only have like a few things so they kept clashing every time so I was just really lucky but I've made some notes about um, kind of some of the key elements that came up um, in those sessions and Judith asked me to give give some homework a composing task at the end of this I think she's given me two minutes to give that at the end of the session so <laughs> but uh, I tried to kind of look at some of the things that have been discussed in the previous sessions as well, as well as look at my own practice. And as Judith said, I 
wear many hats. I, I'm a composer, so I, I, I studied and trained and worked as a composer, as a freelance, freelance composer, but also I've, I've always done a lot of education work. I've set up composing projects, working in schools, and then I guess the most recent one is working as a researcher with the team at BCU with Martin and Victoria who are great um, and, and, and other people and Gary and people so it's been really lovely to actually go back and think about my practice as a composer and talk about that but obviously all these things intersect and interlink and I'm a better composer because I'm a teacher and I'm a better teacher because I'm a researcher and I'm a better researcher you know it all links in so but I'll try and talk about composing in my practice I promise um, so like I said, I did my degree at the Royal Birmingham Conservatoire, started 10 years ago now. Um, so that's a nice round number. And thinking back to that, I realised that actually my composing and creative practices started before that. And actually some really fundamental key things, events or opportunities that I had stay, stay with me as a composer now. Um, so I, I went to a state secondary school in Whitehaven. Anybody know Whitehaven? No, no one's put their hands up. Oh, Gary's nodding. <laughs> so northwest, so kind of go right up north to Scotland and go west till you hit the sea. Maybe come down a little bit, and that's Whitehaven. It's a big, um, used to be a big mining mining town, and now a lot of people um, work at the power plant there, um, Sellafield. So opportunities were a little bit few and far between. But what I did have was an incredibly supportive music education team around me. So that was within classroom teaching, but also a little bit wider with some of the ensembles that I was in. Um, and I really did, I tried to do as much as I possibly could there because it's about two hours from anywhere, White Haven. So, you know, so I was in the local wind band, which was a very traditional wind band that played you know, wind band music. And then, you know, we had like the Moulin Rouge arrangement or the classic you know kind of wind bandy arrangements and things like that so a lot of my education came through instrumental free instrumental lessons and learning with other people and how i got into composing was partly with school um, but also i started to arrange music because i realized that some of the school groups that i was working with um, or well a part of um, the music was not suited to our little orchestra at all. I mean, you may have orchestras too in your ensemble, in your schools where, you know, we sort of had two violinists who were petrified if you gave them anything that involved anything other than open strings. You know, they were incredibly timid and played very quietly and they were very young. But we had this incredible French horn player randomly. And then we had, you know, loads of guitarists because they were made to join the, the orchestra too. We had a few drummers. So we had such a mismatch and completely unbalanced orchestra, but it was still called an orchestra. Um, and I realized, you know, these arrangements were not suited at all for us. Um, the French horn player and trombonist were bored because they were given the really boring line and the violinists were terrified because they were given all the melodies. So I started rearranging the music for them. Um, and I was really lucky that my school teachers sort of went, oh, okay, well, why don't we play this? We could play this. We, we know, we'll, we'll try it out. So I really learned through, through that practice and learning by doing and getting feedback. But, you know, all those things at that time about working really closely with individuals and with sound and, and working out what worked have a huge impact of me as a composer now in how I engage with ensembles and musicians, um, you know, and that's whoa, 15, 6, 20, I can't work out ages, but um, quite a while that that stuck with me. I think as well, what helped, um, what that taught me as well was that working around limitations was very important, you know, that you couldn't just do anything and everything. So I think that was a really important part. And I know in the, a previous session, which talked about kind of composing clubs and giving opportunities for young, you know, young musicians that are kind of musically curious, I think, and the I Compose, I Can Compose lady called it. Um, 
you know, so that could be something there. And I did the same with the wind band. And that led eventually to me composing some stuff for those same groups. So I got into the Royal Birmingham Conservatoire and I thought coming from Northwest State School, I was going to be, I was pretty shocked that I got in. I thought I was going to be the bottom of the bottom. Everybody was going to have so much more experience than me. They would have had private lessons. They would have gone to junior conservatoires. And yes, yeah, some of them had, but some of them hadn't. It was a really diverse group. But actually, the experiences I had been given and the opportunities I was given through my local little groups really put me in a really good position to work with performers just simple things like creating parts and you know just getting to know your musicians and what are they good at what do they like to play that didn't always inform my music of course but it became a kind of starting point to to how I collaborate with musicians that it's not something very separate that I go away and I write my music in my ivory tower you know all in isolation and I hand this masterpiece to my musicians it's not that at all it's very two way um, I do a lot of community work as well where I write write compose uh, write music with community groups so it's it's even less hierarchical and that came from my experience in school but when I went to the conservatoire I think there was I think I've listed about three events that really shook up my composing practice um, for a start it was a bit of a, a shock um, the first year of uni doing composition because you go from um, writing you know composing every so often and sort of for a hobby maybe a couple of things for school to being required to do it every single day pretty much or every week if not every day and there wasn't actually that much support to transition that and I work with undergrads now and I think everybody finds that hard um, but one of the big kind of changes was that I didn't have access to a keyboard or a piano very well um, and I wasn't an early morning person so I wasn't going to beat all the early morning pianists at the, at the college and go in at like six o'clock that wasn't going to happen um, but I did have my flute which is my was my first instrument that I learned in primary um, and so I started using that as a tool and that completely changed how I thought about composing all of a sudden line and shape became much more important than harmony so also I'm not a very good pianist at all I know I've got my piano there but I yeah I'm, I'm not great but I get my pictures from it so it's fine um and it became I think I'd used to use the piano an awful lot because I thought I had to because that's sort of what composers do right they're really good piano players and they have these big chords but using the flute really made me realize that what's important to me is this line and shape of of it and how that changed how i compose is i started to think of harmony in terms of intervals so intervals became really really core part of my kind of harmonic conception so how i layered harmonies i might go back and make you know if i've kind of created a chord because i like this interval and then there's an interval on top and an interval on top i might then go back and say oh that's a c9 chord plus whatever I might do that but not always that became not not as important to, to my practice as a composer and that was kind of through a practical reason um or a lazy reason for not getting up early um, but also I did I do find the piano when I if I sit at the piano I find it really really restricting because it's like you know you've got the white notes and the black notes and that's it you know and actually how I started to think about music was in terms of sound and timbre and combining sounds which is part of the task that I will give you a bit later what that sort of linked to was another process was where I started to map out my pieces so instead of writing very linearly which I used to do in school you start in bar one and then bar two and then bar three and bar four and you just write it kind of in a line um, I started to plan pieces and um, draw out the structure draw out the different sounds perhaps put some intervals in and use a bit of a mixture between text, notation, words. Um, I did find one. It's not a very good example. I don't know if you'll be able to see which way. It's not a very good one, but you see that sort of kind of. So I, that's that. I started doing that, and that's still a practice that I do now. And Judith asked me to kind of come up with, talk about when I get stuck as a composer. What do I do? How do I get around it? And that's possibly one of those things. So once I've done that and I start composing, 
oh no that is composing I've already started composing more and I maybe start putting some detail in and some notes in and you get to that point inevitably of a piece like oh, I don't know what to do next I might go back to that plan and I might look at what's changed or I might look where I was going or I might start in a different section if I've got this big plan oh, I don't want to start at the beginning I might start halfway through or I might kind of so I know where I'm getting to or I might start on the climax um, you know so it, it frees up that that non-linear sort of method which sometimes you know we we kind of attribute to that as composing kind of from beginning to end um, and I think the next the, the last kind of two I think there's two I'm not sure one or two um, is I started the composition diary um, and that was that was a suggestion from my first composition tutor when I was in first year at Bennett um, and he suggested that I just start you know putting notes down and ideas and I think I did buy a manuscript diary and then I was like well this is not for me I don't have perfect pitch <laughs> you know so I ended up not really writing that very much note wise or manuscript wise but just lots of words or ideas or titles for pieces or pieces I'd heard or a squiggle or a sound and that's how I started to just think about composing and develop that composerly thinking over time where it wasn't just like right I've got two hours I'm going to compose no that block out which can be useful well yeah you do need to block out time but actually when your students are really really busy i work a lot with secondary or upper secondary students through external projects that i run and and it's very hard for them to you know block out regular time to compose i i taught at the junior conservatoire for years doing composition and you know the students can't aren't couldn't be expected to bring a new piece every week it was just ridiculous they were under so much pressure but what I did try and support them to do is to just think about what they could do how could they just think about composing or develop their composition and thinking on the go if they're on the bus on the way to school you know or something like that so it just becomes part of their thinking rather than I'm going to compose right now this is my time but to, to develop them as composers and and with that as well, when, when I was working with the Junior Conservatoire, um, you know, a lot of them felt like they had to give me loads of music as well every week. But actually, sometimes, you know, they'd actually just deleted stuff and that's OK, too. And I think that's something that I developed at the Conservatoire was that this idea of playing with material, sometimes going down a path and then realising, oh, this isn't working this is a dead end but it's okay to come back and go down a different path and that's part of it and that's hard when you're under tight restrictions exam time frames all of those things um, but I think that's something that I had to learn to do I found that quite hard when I started going to the conservatoire because um, I think I had been quite formulaic quite practical um, you know following the rules it's very good at following the rules Marie might have you know been um, happy with me following the exam rules or something but actually going to the conservatoire <laughs> or not I don't know not at all no <laughs> thanks for it um, you know so I had to really learn how to kind of break those and break away and be really kind of much more free in my process and I found that hard and I work with students who I think who are quite low in confidence perhaps like I was that um, that it's okay to do that to to delete things or to Kind of go down a path and that that's not the right way so i think that's um you know something that i see a lot with my my lower confidence students if, if, if something's not going right then that's okay that's sort of building up resilience to that so i think that's my main my main points i'm just at 15 minutes so i will stop there but i just want to say i think all those early experiences and some things that happened by accident that my teacher you know saw this arrangement and said oh let's play it and took a risk and just said let's try it out tonight let's print the music and do it you know what what <laughs> no, it was that was terrifying but i learned so much or you know just realizing i could compose on my flute or that i could draw out a structure which took 10 minutes instead of waiting three weeks to write the whole piece all these things made a big impact and they're still with me in how I compose now so yeah that's me thank you Kirsty 
That's really interesting um, to hear about your po how you've developed your process over time as well. Um, and I think next week, which will have a slightly different feel to it, we're hoping to hear from some uh, young composers even younger than Kirsty, uh, and to hear some of their formative experiences as well. So you've kind of um, given us a bit of a, a preview there. That's great. So I'm going to pass straight to Louise now, who is teaching in a secondary school in Solihull. And um, Louise did, she, in fact, you are a master's, you have a master's in teaching and learning now, don't you, Louise? You um, completed the list of Imagine Compose um, master's to last year I can't remember um, and as, as part of the research you did some action research into sort of the creative process and helping students in the classroom be more creative so over to Louise thank you hopefully you can all um, see my PowerPoint presentation um, so it's really great to, um, to be invited um, today and to speak to you all. Um, and Judith gave me um, the title of helping students understand the creative process. Um, and I think that's important because I think we can all associate with the fear of that blank piece of paper, whether it's a manuscript or that open document that we've got to um, do, or maybe for our students when they open the exam paper and just see all those blank lines that um, they have to fill. And so um, one of the questions I've been thinking about for today is, do we teach process when we teach composition? Um, and I'll explain what I mean by that. So I think we're really excellent as music teachers at teaching the music theory and how we would go about creating the composition. So I imagine you've all got lessons where you talk about um, chord progressions and then maybe how we write a melody over a chord progression, how you'd write a drum line. Um, and that's excellent and important. I wonder how much emphasis we put on the actual process of getting a piece from start to finish. So the planning of it, the editing, um, the evaluation. And I think other subjects are much better at doing that. So for example, English, they will go into the exam, they'll read their question and they know they have to plan, then write an intro with a certain structure. Um, and although they've been taught all the knowledge and techniques to get the best answer, they've been taught a process of how to write this essay. Um, and I wonder if we're as good as maybe those subjects um, in music. I think there might be two reasons that maybe we're not, um, firstly, we don't have as much time in our curriculum as English um, and I um, always feel the strain of trying to get everything covered for the GCSE exam in my limited um, curriculum and I think the other reason that we wouldn't necessarily teach um, a process is because um, each creative individual is different um, and even one composer would approach a composition in different ways. I think about my compositions and Sometimes I've just written a piece in one go because I've just had inspiration and it's just done. Sometimes I write a little bit and I won't come back to it for a couple of months. And sometimes at university, you had like a week um, to write a piece and it was really um, theoretical to get it done. Um, and I think maybe that's why we don't teach the process. Um, but today, I'm hoping you'll see the benefits um, of why we should. Um, so I thought we'd begin and look at some theories um, about what the creative process is. Um, and so I'll start with um, Sloboda. He thinks that there are two stages in composition. Um, so the first one he calls um, inspiration. And this is where you get the initial idea or the initial theme. Um, and it, he talks about it coming um, in consciousness. Um, and then the second stage is the execution. So where you um, deliberately develop it, extend it and transform it. Um, so that, that's one theory. Um, Wallace, um, in The Art of Thought, um, he thinks that there's four. So there's the preparation, um, which is where you reset research the problem or maybe plan out how you're going to um, proceed with your creativity. 
um, he then talks about this incubation period, um, which is when, um, which we all probably do without realizing when you um, just leave it and you don't do anything, but um, the ideas are playing in your mind when you're not working. So often you'll hear people say, oh, I'll stop doing that, I'll come back to it tomorrow and I hope I'll get a fresh idea. And that's because the fresh ideas come through that period of incubation. Um, then he talks about illumination, which is the Eureka experience where you know what you're going to do. And then the verification, which is the refining and adapting, getting it um, into the finished product. Um, as Judith said um, a year ago, um, I wrote my master's dissertation um, on um, the creative process. Um, and I looked at um, how students' creativity progressed in secondary school in composition. Um, but I looked really closely at what else was developing at the same time as their creativity. And I came up with this model um, and I came to the conclusion that there were three things that were being um, developed during their time in secondary school. Um, so obviously um, there's the music theory and the knowledge that should hopefully develop through um, being taught and that was in the um, blue side. And then alongside that, you've got the psychology of um, children just growing up um, and their hormones and how they um, see the world. Um, and so that's in the pink. Um, and then what I also noticed through my research was how children approach a task and their process of completing the task change as they got older. Um, we don't have time to look at all of this today, so I've just been asked to talk about process. So we're just going to look at the yellow, um, which you can see. Um, so the research that I did was that um, I took a group from each year group um, and I was the worst teacher in the world. I just um, put them in a room and said, here's a picture of a car chase. You've got half an hour to make a piece of music, shut the door. Um, and left them to it and I recorded everything they did and I recorded their final piece um, and then I had the absolute joy um, of listening to all of this back and seeing what they got up to and um, what I found was and I'm sure that some of you can probably see this in your classroom the younger years um, went straight to the instruments and started to improvise straight away um, I did, probably the excitement of having instruments so the year seven spent about a quarter of their time just making noise and improvising. Um, and then their process in the younger years was that they just all put their separate improvisations together um, and just kind of hope it worked. Um, and if it didn't work, they'd just go off again on their own and just make up some more. Um, as they got a bit older, um, they did, they approached it in the same way, but they started off by discussing what they were going to do. So they had a group intention and then they'd still go off on into their own corners of the room and make their own improvisation and try and put it together. So it's not and really, it wasn't until we got to the balance stage that they worked as a group. So they made their own improvisations, but they were willing to compromise. So um, the guitarist played what they came up with and the drummer said, oh, that's good, but it didn't really fit with what I thought, but I can change what I'm going to do. Um, because there may be more emphasis on getting a quality piece than having their own work um, shown. The older students, though, there was a lot more discussion, a lot less actual musical activity, a lot of talking. Um, and they worked through it all together. So, right, let's start with the piano. What are you going to play? I think you should do this. Can you try this? Okay, that's fine. Let's move to the um, next instrument, the guitar. Great. What are you going to do? Right. Does that fit with that? Wonderful. Loads of discussion um, and all collectively, lots of consultation. Um, I wonder if that's because that's how I taught them composition or they've been doing composition in their coursework, but that's how they went. And it wasn't until maybe the end of their time in secondary school that they went back to improvisation, but they had the ability to 
do it collaboratively. So the pianist started and then the drummer kind of got what he was doing and it improvised so it fitted um, together. It was the older years that did a lot more editing and extending. The younger years just, they made their 20 seconds and they stuck with it and they just kept practicing um, and there was no development there. Um, and so um, I think this is how process and children's process to composition um, develops through time. Um, but how, you know, why is this interesting to you as teachers? How can you apply this in the classroom? What should we be doing? Um, and so um, I asked my students um, how they would define the process. And I think we all think that everybody knows how to, how they would go about writing a piece of music. Um, and so I gave them a questionnaire to see if they really do. Um, so this was one of the questions in the questionnaire um, and you're welcome to do the question right now. So I gave them what I think are the seven things that you would do um, as part of the composition process. So at some point you're gonna extend your piece. So maybe add another section or an idea or add dynamics and articulation. At some point you need to improvise ideas or come up with the initial idea, however you would do it. There's obviously a final um, bit, so handing in your work or performing it to the class, depending on um, what the task is. Um, you need to understand what you've got to do, understand the brief, kind of make a plan in your head about key decisions, um, editing it, changing your work, um, putting all your sections into a different order would be another thing you would do. And then obviously you should be listening to your work back throughout the process and deciding what needs to change or what you would do next. Um, and so I gave these to the students as I'm giving them to you and said, okay, number them from one to seven, which would you do first? Which would you do last? Um, now, um, there's 5,050 different combinations that these could be put in. Um, and my students came back with 14. Um, the top one was the most common. Um, and I think we can kind of understand how that would work as a process. Um, some of the more interesting ones are below it. So the middle one, the children thought that you would understand and plan the task. Then you would evaluate um, how good your understanding was, even though you hadn't written any, anything at this point. Then you would extend that nothingness that they hadn't done. Then they might come up with their first idea. Then they would edit that idea. Then they would order it and they would hand it in. And then um, the last one, they thought that they would take the work that they hadn't written yet and put it in an order. Then they would evaluate that. Then they might understand if they were doing the right thing and um, what their plan was. Then they would edit, even though at this point they'd still not come up with an idea. Um, then they would come up with an idea, then they would extend it, and then they would hand it in. Um, and so I think what I got from my questionnaire is that the children really didn't understand the process. 76% um, of them did put the understand plan as the first thing they do. Um, and around 90% put final performance. You'd think the word final would have maybe given them a hint. Um, some thought that the improvising would be the last thing you would do um, and some evaluate, which I can maybe understand because of their other subjects. Um, so what have I done in my own classroom? So I now give the children this process, um, which is obviously up for debate and different composers would um, disagree, but um, this is the process that I give them. So with my key stage four, I put it on the board um, for them to just refer to throughout the lesson. And maybe in key stage three, I wouldn't put up on the board, but I would plan my lesson into the sections. So I don't hand out, if we were doing composition on a xylophones, I don't hand out the beaters and um, I make them talk about it first. And then we hand out the beaters and then we might stop and say, right, play what you've got so far. What do you think about it? Make some changes. So I structure it that way. Um, so I found doing this that the students are a lot more productive when they use the model um, and more work was completed in the lessons. Um, a lot of my students don't have composition experience or they don't do it at home. 
um, and definitely have low confidence um, and are really slow. Um, but this definitely has helped. Um, they were more confident and they'll put stuff on the score. I think before they thought as soon as it goes on the score, it's got to stay and they can't delete it. Whereas this gave them the confidence that it might be edited, it might be moved and that's okay. It's not permanent once it's been put on the computer. Um, they're a lot more independent. They um, don't ask for help as much. I think that's because they can just look at the process rather than me coming over, listening to it, saying, that's really good, you should add a bit more now, or they go, miss, it doesn't sound very good, what should I do? Um, they know that they have to edit it, or they know that they should listen to it back. Um, and also they're just able to talk about that process and where they are and what they're doing a lot better, which is important at Key Stage 4, because my exam board had to write a log, and they were able to do that much more effectively because they knew um, what they were doing and what stages they were at. Um, if you, you know, aren't convinced, the students have said, um, it helps me understand the terms and techniques I could use better, such as realising I should edit my work while making more additions to it. It helps me plot my work and extend my work. Um, it gives me a clear order on what to do and doesn't leave me clueless. Um, and so I've really seen the benefits of teaching um, the process and incorporating it in my lessons. And um, on Monday, I've got the exciting job of um, being grilled by the head teacher about my new curriculum. Um, and obviously she's gonna ask questions like, why should music even be in the curriculum? Um, and um, one of the questions she's gonna ask is, how do I know my curriculum is successful? Um, and I'm just, one of my aims is that I develop independent musicians um, and I want my students to be able to do music and carry on with their music beyond the five years that they're with me. And independent learners, independent composers need to be able to manage their time um, and they need to know their structure. And so if I don't teach it to them, um, how um, will they know? And that's why I just think this is all really important. So thank you for your time and thank you for inviting me. Um, Thank you, Louise. That's really interesting. Um, that's great. Um, okay, so I'm conscious of the time. Um, we're going to take a very short break. So if anybody wants to go and make a cup of tea or go to the loo or anything like that, now is your chance. And um, we're going to take a break until 20 past. Um, and in that time, I'm going to play uh, a, a very short music track. Um, some people, were, if you were here last week, you'll remember that Jackie Walduck, who is an improviser and vibes player, she set a, a creative task, which was to um, have a go at improvising. It was intended for the people in the Zoom call. Um, and I invited people to have a go at the improvisation task and to uh, send in a video or a sound file of themselves. Well, I did get one submission. One teacher, who I think is here today, Bex, um, she set it actually as her composition challenge for her uh, pupils at school this week. So we've got a really fantastic soundtrack from uh, a year nine pupil who has taken up Jackie's challenge and I'm going to play it now. Um, it lasts a minute so you might want to listen to that before you go and get your cup of tea.
Okay, so I think um, it's 20 past three and we should um, start uh, the next session. Um, so I've got great pleasure in, in inviting uh, Marie Besant from OCR to talk to us next about um, about creativity and exam boards. Um, can I hand over to you, Marie? Absolutely. I'm hoping that means that everybody just gets to see me. I don't have a screen to share. Um, I'm just going to uh, make sure I can't also. I, I am going to look at myself like Kirsty didn't want to because otherwise I have no idea what my face is doing and it can be really quite embarrassing. So for those of you that don't know me. Um, I'm Marie. I'm the um, actually lead subject advisor at OCR and I've been looking after music since 2014. I actually look after the entire performing arts um, suite of qualifications for so music and drama and our vocational performing arts and I also um, look after all of the other subject advisors as well. So I'm quite, quite busy at the moment. Um, this summer has been um, absolutely nuts for us, as I'm sure you can imagine. Ofqual have just published their consultation on what they think they might do for 2021. So please respond to that because the only way we'll get any sensible changes for 2021 is if people actually respond and Ofqual agree to go with the proposals that we got to put forward. Anyway, so I was invited to speak and I will try to be efficiently within my time to talk about the fact that teachers say that pupils are marked down if they produce something creative for exam boards. Discuss. Now, Judith knows I like these meaty argumentative type um, talks and I really, really do. But I'm going to start with a couple of reflections because I like to emulate the great Fortley, who is also here. So my first reflection that I'd like to start with is that we are really lucky to be a subject that gets a lot of freedom. All subjects at school have got prescribed topics, prescribed practitioners, prescribed techniques that we must learn. And most of the other subjects are assessed in a linear fashion with an exam paper at the end of the course. So we need to absolutely not lose sight that no matter what the restrictions are when it comes to assessment, that we have got a deal of freedom and our national curriculum and our subject content for GCSE and A-level music is really quite flexible and allows a lot of room for movement and creativity, which is my second reflection, which happily ties really nicely into Victoria's presentation. So creativity is not limited to the creative subjects. And I've actually got a real problem with creative subjects as a moniker, um, because, you know, maths can be creative. I wish it had been. I might have understood it had my maths teacher approached it in a creative way at school. Same for physics and chemistry and anything like that that's academic you know product of a grammar school academic was academia and anything creative was you know shoved shoved to the side so those are the two reflections that I just wanted to, to open up with before I go on to the sort of contentious topic of, of exam boards crushing creativity which in a way we do I'm aware that I'm being recorded and that I represent an entire exam board right now <laughs> Um, I was part of, as, as Kirsty knows, Kirsty met up with me really early a lot on in the days of, of writing the new specifications and really dug into what the assessment objectives were. I was unable to take a lot of, well, I spoke to a professional composer who's doing a PhD actually, and she told me, you know, was able to take a lot of that conversation back when we were talking to Offball about what the subject content and the assessment objectives and those weightings should look like. Um, so really, Composing is broadly a third of our GCSE and A-level content because it's performing, composing and appraising. Within those, we've got further strands of things that we have to look at that we're assessing. But importantly, we're supposed to, even though we're not allowed to assess it in an integrated fashion, this is why I have to watch my face, it doesn't get all year nine attitude all over it, we're not allowed to assess it in an integrated fashion. We have to assess performing, composing and listening and appraising as, as separate entities, the wisdom of the assessment specialists at Ofqual and the DfE. That doesn't mean we shouldn't teach it in an integrated way and that's where the creativity can really thrive there because if you're integrating, you're listening and you're performing, your composing grows out of the, the listening that you're doing and the performing that you're doing, those, it's giving you those skills. We also strive at OCR and I know that um, a couple of the other exam boards we you know we were all a lot on a very similar page and we were writing our marking criteria for that composing criteria to be really quite holistic so it needed to be applied to whatever style of composing we, we were getting to from these students and it's worth remembering here that at GCSE the exam boards are not the assessors 
I know there's a lot of moderator bashing goes on in the exam boards. So there was a thread that I, I had to put my iPad down and walk away from in order to not wade into a Facebook argument the other day when somebody said, oh, moderation's wildly inaccurate. Well, oh, that's all the moderator's fault when things get moved down. Maybe. Again, I'm just going to leave that one there. But this marking criteria has got to absolutely fit whatever the style of composition that we've got. And I know that at OCR, we do see a great deal of different styles and types of composing. Um, going back to something again from Victoria's that, that, that sparked something that I was going to say anyway about, it's not just about the classical rules, it's about relevance to the students that are in your classroom. We, you know, there's, there's more than one style of music, and, but we actually shouldn't be placing a value judgment on any of it, I don't think. And again, that's something that I know OCR's specifications strive to, to encourage. You know, it's not about classical is better than jazz is better than the blues is better than being a DJ is better than grime. It's all valuable. It's all music. And the theory that Louise was talking about can be absolutely applied to all of those musics. Music is music is music. The theory applies to all of them and we can teach them. There is a place to sit them down and talk, them, talk to them with a piece of paper about this is how... Bark harmony works or this is a cadence and this is a chord progression but it's about making it all be, be part of the music a little bit more background for you so assessment unfortunately i learned having come out of the classroom having been the head of music for ages thrown into the deep end of working at an exam board and having to design assessment and being in charge of that criteria obviously thankfully there's a group of 36 other experts that, that helped with the OCR specifications, but assessment has got to draw a line and make a judgment. This causes a massive issue, and I've written under my notes here, rules, Kirsty. <laughs> because, yeah, the rules are there. We do need to know about them, but I would always encourage students to break them, to see how far they bend before they break. You need to have an, an understanding of how other musics work as a springboard for your own, for your own creativity. Music creativity doesn't start from nothing, I don't think. Happy to be argued with. Um, also, the process thing. Oh, no, not so I was agreeing with you, Kirsten. No, no, not, don't be sorry. <laughs> Gave me more to say. Um, like anybody ever needs to do that. Also, the process versus the end product. Again, this, this was really nicely something that Louise said is something that I was going to say as well. You know. Again, at the exam boards, we were given the requirement that we were only allowed to assess the end product of the composing. We put forward in our first specification rounds of, of submissions to Ofqual, having, having a composing log, and we were told we weren't allowed one. So the exam board that got that through, the loophole is it doesn't somehow be assessed as part of the composing, but they were absolutely adamant that the process of composing cannot be validly and reliably assessed. They said the entire opposite thing for drama and devising your own piece of theatre, however, there's actually more assessment weighting given to the process in drama when there is absolutely zero given to the process in music. But that again, picking up that creativity thing, at an exam board, we would never tell you not to teach the process. The process is the creativity. So I suppose what I'm really saying here is that the exam boards wouldn't tell you to not be creative with your composing. We want to see those, those creative comp compositions, but it's finding the balance between teaching your students to break those rules and find their own expression. The five words I wrote down, incidentally, Victoria, I put exploration, courage, expression, discovery, and mistakes for me. But I thought my students, you know, I told a story yesterday on a different webinar about one of my students once drew a picture of me um, with a guitar as like a hammer destroying a beautifully written word creativity because he'd done something so off-piste and avant-garde that I, I couldn't mark it against the assessment criteria and it broke my heart for both reasons that I couldn't mark it against the assessment criteria but that he thought I was crushing his creativity so I think my students would think of the characteristics of creativity being individuality making and creating ownership that's really important to them and expression and that is something that you know as teachers we can let them do that in the lessons we can let them do that from early years all the way up to year 13 before we send them on their merry way to, to composing at university but it's about having to unfortunately 
there is a necessity in every single subject in school because these dastardly GCSEs, A-levels and vocational qualification assessments exist, we do have to teach them to rein it back in because assessment at the end of the day is a range of criteria that you're demonstrating your understanding of and, and it's about finding that balance between teaching them the processes that helps them find their own creativity and, and, and find the joy in composing, which brings me to the other thing that I wanted to talk about, the, the forced to study removes the enjoyment. I'm absolutely paraphrasing Victoria's slide there. Um, we need to keep and foster that enjoyment. It's, it's our moral obligation as, as teachers to somehow defy the exam board criteria and make sure that no matter what subject we're teaching it actually even though we're all musicians in the room today the fact that we are making them learn a particular thing in a particular way from a certain angle in order to be assessed on it there is a danger that they're going to end up not enjoying it i dropped performance in my final year of university because it destroyed my will to want to make any noise in front of an audience I don't want my students to ever feel that way. Um, I still can't perform unless it's for a wedding and no one's looking at me because that's what it did to me. It destroyed my enjoyment that much. And that really resonated with me actually, Victoria. So I think exam boards, we, we want to help you be as creative as possible, but we do unfortunately have a duty to, to find a way to assess that creativity. So I think as an exam board, I'm chucking it back at the teachers and saying, know what the criteria are and find find a line find that that balance to be struck between fostering that enjoyment and that creativity and letting them write all over the walls and for want of a better analogy and then reining it back in what what can we take from your work that demonstrates your ability to cross off this exam board criteria that we all including from within the exam board do want to rebel against a little efficiently 12 minutes so three minutes for anyone to shout at me. I'm happy for that to happen. Judith, or, or, or back to you. Yeah, thank you, Marie. That was really, that was great. Really interesting. And and it felt like a, a bit of myth busting there as well. So it was- I love that. That's my favorite thing to do. Yeah. Um, I mean, the intention is to now go into some breakout groups and to discuss um, the questions that Martin actually posed at the beginning. I suppose if anybody's got a specific question for Marie that's around creativity as opposed to an OCR specific question, then do post it in the chat now and we could quickly ask her. If not, we'll go straight into the breakout groups. So anything specifically for Marie? Hi, could I ask a question? Would that be okay? Sure. Yes. Um, you said one of your students did something tr truly creative. Why couldn't you then assess it for the board? I'm not a music teacher, so. Well, to be fair, it was awful. <laughs> so it, he was, this was a, I was, I was at a college and um, I had a particular student that, that hadn't had any prior musical training and his, his, own impression and his own opinion of his work was that it was just really creative and therefore I couldn't understand it but it it wasn't long enough for a start there wasn't particular there weren't there weren't no matter what kind of there wasn't a sense of style there wasn't um sort of development of any ideas it was difficult to find the ideas it was um entirely done he'd used a a, a computer program that he'd ripped off the internet and it was just it was just noise so that was an absolute exception, but his perception was still that I'd taken his individuality and decided it, it wasn't any good. So what I did, my, my solution for him was to actually put the picture on my office wall and I sat him down and spoke, talked to him through the criteria and broke it down and said, you know, this is where I've taught you how to do this and this is where I've taught you how to do that. And what about this exercise here that you did that was actually quite good and this exercise here that, that we thought sounded like a bit of a bop that everyone was, was dancing along to in their lesson that time um, and helped him realise that it wasn't that I was just anti other music. It was that he needed to have actually put some ideas coherently somewhere for it to have begun to be a composition, if that makes sense. Okay, so I think we'll go into our breakout groups. Um, I'm gonna repost Martin's, um, Martin's questions so that we can, so that you can see them in the chat box whilst you're in the breakout groups. I think that there's quite a few questions ranging from what is creativity in music education? 
and is music education automatically creative? Uh, and then sort of is composing, listening, performing, are they all equally creative? Uh, and does key stage three value creativity? That's some of the questions. And um, you might want to choose one or two, or you want to ref you might want to reflect particularly on some of the uh, sort of points that some of the speakers have um, made earlier. So um, when you go into the group, um, elect somebody to be a sort of spokesperson so that you can feed back at the end because it would be nice to hear what you you know what's particularly caught your imagination what you think your learning might be from today um, so make sure you know who's going to do that so that you can report back and um, we will go now and we'll come back at 10 to 4. Um, I'm handing over to Heather who I don't know if you want to say anything to Heather yeah. or just send people off we're going to just spend a minute per group um, asking somebody to, from each group to feed back um, whatever the key points were. And if that person could then write it into the chat afterwards, that would also be great. So have we got somebody um, who, somebody just step forward from one of the groups and, and fire away, please. Sorry, um, I was typing up. Um, so we discussed um, the creativity being based on the level of the teacher's experience. Going back to um, what Kirsty was saying, it's like, how does the teacher's experience um, uh, um, shape the way they teach composition? And have they been taught composition and therefore they've been asked to teach composition? Um, and all the experiences and teacher confidence, how does that kind of relate into their practice of teaching composition? Uh, we also talked about uh, the time constraints. Having less time at maybe key stage three or key stage four is equal to less creativity, but basically up, up, up at like year 12 or 13, you've got a bit more time with them and therefore there's more creativity. So is there a kind of time slash creativity balance? Um, we also talked about, do we teach composition and therefore are we then a composer? Or are we just teaching composition and totally ripping apart year 12 or 13 compositions for the basis of um, then we call ourselves our composer? If we're teaching composition, does that make us a composer? I think that's the question. Um, and then also we talked about, is the answer to the question, is music education creative? Um, we just, we, well, there's basically kind of like a big no, it wasn't. I think the education and the creativeness comes from the teacher itself. Um, and also that we talked about how that uh, teacher being creative is all about the process and the final product rather than not just the final product kind of disagreeing with Marie almost not more on fight about it and the talk about the exam waiting is like um, someone said it was interesting some people said it was disgusting that some people were focusing on not the process but rather than the, the final product there you go I've got that all I'm just going to copy and paste it out thank you Adam uh, so is there a spokesperson from another group please hi we were group two um, so creativity in music education, um, we said both the teaching and the learning need to be creative. Um, and for teachers, so having a different approach possibly with each student. Um, and uh, agency, individuality and authenticity and fostering that in all students, that's like really key. Um, what is creativity when composing? We thought it was um, freedom of ideas, not just following strict guidelines and daring to try new things uh, and using your current vocabulary in new ways. We talked about how the exercises where uh, you're conducting with your hands and creating this amazing improvisation, you couldn't then submit that for a DCC composition necessarily because it might not do very well. Um, but you use that to build your own vocabulary and then uh, I, th I think it was Tom in our group said that um, it your uh, your DCC composition is not your debut EP. It's you working within the criteria that you've been given. Um, and are composing, performing, listening, appraising, or listening or appraising all equally creative? I think we sort of put them in composing, performing, appraising, but said that it completely depends upon the context. Thank you very much. And if you could possibly put, type the key points of that into the chat. Um, so we can extract it. That would be great. Thank you. Who's next? I can be next. Um, we talked about the, the sort of difficulty of articulating creativity to others um, within within schools, particularly to SLT and, it, and its value. And is there not just it's sort of the, the sort of feeling that oh, it'd be great to just have one definitive definition. We also talked about 
whether whether there was ways of finding a co common vocabulary common vocabulary processes links with other subjects such as creative writing that might help this process and then we were also just musing on you know well can you teach or assess creativity um or, or does it actually the teaching and the assessing of it actually stifle it i hope that's a, a summary of a good enough you know, summary of our discussion great thanks nancy um somebody else yeah, yeah uh, cool. uh, so group five we um were talking about pupils not wanting to take risks and um, wanting to make sure they're getting things right rather than being experimental and um, that also can be created by the teacher in the fact that we sometimes work to six week long units or topics that fit a certain amount of time and therefore each lesson is a process that then builds towards a assessment criteria that we've decided um, is a sort of easy way of assessing what level the pupil is working at but rather than just giving them the freedom to go out and create something that we can then work out afterwards how good it is, um, rather than trying to fit what we want them to do. Um, in terms of listening being as important, and we said that actually listening can be a creative thing because you can imagine and see pictures within music and spot things going on there. And in terms of the exam boards, um, sometimes it can be quite a prescriptive thing working towards making sure you've ticked all of the right boxes. Great, thank you very much. Uh, there's one person to go. Yep, finally, uh, group four. <laughs> okay, so we um, start off talking about um, our own creative experiences and how we sort of within, we try to foster creativity or creative activities we've sort of done in the classroom. And they kind of, there's some very things we talked about, um, exploration and having non-musical starting points and, um, hang on, let me just put, look at my notes. Um, Theming, oh, having some planning sort of um, concepts within there, doing improvising, collaborative sharing where you have um, either students um, discussing what they hear from each other's work and then suggestions on how it could, be, could improve for people to explore or questioning to find out how it could improve or um, actually getting the students to play um, the work that's being composed and see if how, what's played is actually what they intended to be done and where's that actually led the piece to go. Um, and then we talked about the sort of how does key stage three sort of value um, creativity. Because overall in schools, generally at the moment, creativity is not favoured. In fact, I was saying um, literally this week, we've had a whole thing about no fun, no creativity, no exploration. No, it's like, no, it has to be this, this and this. And I'm like, um, that's not quite the arts. Um, but it's all very dependent on your curriculum or your teacher, we were saying. So um, it's very easy, especially sort of 10 years ago when there's big focus on genre and topics to be very much um, play a piece, do a pastiche work rather than explore and experiment and develop and move beyond the boundaries. So it, yeah, it completely depends on the delivery really. Thank you, Ruth. And I can see you're in your classroom, aren't you? You're in school. <laughs> Great. Okay, so we've got five minutes left um, to wrap up and also to um, set a creative task for next week. Um, so perhaps the first thing I should do is hand over to Kirsty, who's going to set the creative task, and I'm going to share my screen so that we can see what it is. Um, I had actually slightly. I was I was just enjoying the conversations, and I've got oh yeah, I'm doing something now. <laughs> yes. So. So um, in a weird way, I think it's sort of the task is sort of related to Victoria's paperclip task where I guess it's trying to think of lots of different uses and imagining so I've called it a sort of imagining sound sort of task um, and this is something that I give to secondary students and I'll give to my undergrads as well especially if they're writing for like smaller groups of instruments so like, like little chamber I mean that that associates western classical I know but like smaller groups so trios even duos, quartets, especially if they're different instruments, but it could be used for larger pieces as well. So I stuck with that three. So kind of picking three instruments, maybe from different instrumental families, um, but you, you know, it wouldn't have to be that. And perhaps thinking, using your own instrument as one of those three. And then what I ask my students to do is to list the different sounds and techniques 
techniques each instrument can do. Um, so you can go on to the next slide, Judith. Um, oh. <laughs> oh. There we are. Yeah, I've, I've got an example here. So, you know, this could be through exploration. Um, something I did with a project called the Young Composers Project that I run at in Birmingham Conservatoire is we were doing about strings. So I went and raided the cupboards, I asked. And apparently there's loads of old string instruments. Most of them were sort of broken or only had a few strings or whatever. But I went and raided them and then gave groups in threes in violins to try and play and just experiment and come up with any sounds that they could make they came up with crazy things, putting paper in between things it was it was a great session um to get that practical but obviously if you can't have access to that there's loads of resources on youtube i'm always forever looking about you know brass mutes because i'm always forgetting like which one is which? Brass is probably the only instrument I don't play. So I don't have a physical like understanding of it. Um, so I'm um, percussion, you know, there's, uh, yeah. So YouTube and online resources, so good. So list all those different sounds and different techniques in this sort of grid format. And then there's different things you can do. So you don't have to do all of these, but something that I started with and something that I really oh, love. Sorry. Oh, um, is about blending sounds. So if you went into that list and you could kind of draw a line between the sounds that blend well together, that kind of combine or kind of merge into each other. And um, so I've got here like a trombone slide and a cello glissando and a guitar bend. So they're all like slidey sort of sounds. Then you could find three sounds that are really contrasting. So maybe something very percussive with something very sustained. You could then think about combining techniques in one of the instruments, so just going along that list. So instead of just having a tremolo, you could have a tremolo with a crescendo, with a mute, on sol pont, on a harmonic. Like you can layer up these techniques as well to create something really unique. Um, and then I've just put kind of, imagine two interesting sounds. So it doesn't have to be contrasting, it doesn't have to be blend, just something kind of interesting. You thought, oh, I've never thought of you know, a high bassoon with a kind of harmonic um, on the, um, the guitar or something like that. And then there's an extension, you know, you could map out that piece, perhaps graphically, or start that piece even, um, if you, and, and explore, use that piece to explore the idea of blending and contrasting sound. So it's kind of an open kind of task. Yeah, so that's some things you could do. Thank you, Kirsty. So I think that that's something if you want to have a go with, at that either for yourself to sort of test your own, you know, ways of generating composing um, in a sort of different creative approach, or you could try it with some pupils. If you have anything, I guess it's a sort of if you produce or if somebody produces a graphic score or a notator score, and if you get it to be before the end of Wednesday next week, then I could happily compile something and we can sort of put it up on the screen during the um, interlude that we have in the final session next week. It'd be really lovely to see um, anything that, that results from that. Or And we'll put that task on the website anyway, so that it's there as a sort of resource. Oh, here's a, a practical activity I can do um, with whichever group you want to use it with. Thank you, Kirsty. So um, it remains me just to say thank you for coming today and thank you to the contributors it's been really interesting again um again we'll document we'll put all the presentations and the video of this session up on the list of magic compost website and i will um send out a follow-up email probably tomorrow with some of the links and things like that as well um next week's um a little bit different uh, we're, we're going to spend some time together as a group I think I think one of the amazing things that we've done is really think about how to support young composers over the we've this is our fifth week now and we've really thought about how to support young composers in the classroom sort of in schools outside of that context how do we support within instrumental learning context we've been thinking about creativity today um, and we feel that there's a real need to come together as practitioners and as people who support young composers um, to sort of provide more of a network and a support network for them because unlike instrumentalists they don't really have that out there the opportunities aren't so well mapped out you know just hearing Kirsty's story about you know she had a supportive teacher at school and she had these opportunities and how can we make sure that everybody has those kinds of opportunities and, and that everybody can flower and flourish 
and be creative in that way. Um, so we want to sort of turn our minds to the future like that next week. Um, that's kind of all I'm going to say. Don't want to give out any spoilers. Um, so looking forward to doing that next week. Um, same time, same place. Um, and I think that's it. Thank you very much, everybody. See you soon.